All right, guys. So we're going to go over some important information here. What this video is going to do is it's going to be a tool for you guys, for yourselves, and for others to show that the United States was incorporated and to show uh, the intentional uh, breakdown of our very freedoms, liberties, um, of our country's sovereignty, and how the control was taken um, by these bankers, okay? So I'm thinking that this video will end up being used, uh, I may add this as one of the wake up uh, program videos because this is going to have a lot of very good facts in it. So let's proceed. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their money, the banks and corporations that will go up around them will deprive the people of their property until their children will wake up homeless. Thomas Jefferson. Following is a timeline demonstrating when and how a private central banking cartel got control of the government, the people, and the assets of the United States. Each fact is supported by official sources. Source documents are available at www.anticorruptionsociety.com under the tab Source Documents. 1913. With the passage of the Federal Reserve Act, a private foreign banking cartel was made the fiscal agent of the United States. Source document, Representative McFadden, Congressional Record, June 1932. Okay, so, as they just referenced, the Federal Reserve Act, okay? So, let's go take a look at that. This here is the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. 63rd Congress of the United States of America at the second session. Washington on Monday the first day Monday the first day of December 1913 1913 okay um an act to provide for the establishment of Federal Reserve Banks to furnish an elastic currency to afford means of rediscounting commercial paper. To establish a more effective supervision of banking in the United States and for other purposes. Wherever the word bank is used in this act, the word shall be held to include state bank, banking association, and trust company. Uh, be it enacted by the state and House or Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled that the short title of this act shall be the Federal Reserve Act. The terms National Bank and National Banking Association used in this act shall be synonym, synonymous uh, and interchangeable. The term member bank shall be held to mean any national bank, state bank, or bank or trust company that becomes one a uh, member of those reserve banks created by this act. The term board shall be held to mean Federal Reserve Board. It's just all over verbiage, but in here basically is where that monster called the Federal Reserve uh, was enacted. Okay, um, if I was to read all of it, then it would take forever. So what I will do is leave you guys the links so you can do your own due diligence. But as you can see here, this is where it all, well, it began before that, but this is where the last uh, roundabout uh, began okay and then that also goes to here
Now, let's get back to the video. From the website of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, quote, the entry of the United States into World War I added to the responsibilities of the young Federal Reserve Bank. It helped finance U.S. military expenditures by becoming the fiscal agent of the federal government. 1920, Congress handed the U.S. Treasury over to the same private banking cartel via the Independent Treasury Act. Source document, Independent Treasury Act. Now, as you heard, Congress handed the U.S. Treasury over to the same private banking cartel via the Independent Treasury Act. Now, especially with the accounts and everything we've been accessing and, you know, all of the information we've been going to find, this is all very relevant, okay? Um, this shows it's the same, it's the same banking cartel. So that's showing everybody that, yes, that is where the accounts are, are held, okay? If you, if you just think, if you, if you think about it, this is that Independent Treasury Act. This is the act that allowed the Monopoly Corporation Federal Reserve to take over the United States Treasury. I have uploaded this information to Internet via United States Code Title 17, Section 107 for fair use. And let's zoom in. Okay. Statutes at large of the United States of America from May 1919 to March 1921. Concurrent resolutions of the two houses of Congress. Recent treaties, conventions, and executive proclamations amended to the Constitution. Edited, printed, and published by authority of Congress under the direction of the Secretary of State. Public acts and resolutions, private acts, resolutions, concurrent resolutions, um, etc., etc. Whoops, didn't want to go that far. Benefits hereof shall make the required payments and perform such other acts that may be required within the time fix and regulations otherwise of any right and advantage claimed under this act shall be forfeited. Uh, let's see. And here, folks, so here we got the Independent Treasury uh, Act, okay? Section 3595 of the Revised Statutes of the United States is amended, providing for the appointment of an assistant treasurer of the United States, Boston, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So it goes down here, and basically, um, the. Let's see where it, uh, all laws or parts of laws as they are authorized the establishment or maintenance of offices of such assistant treasurers or sub treasuries of the United States are hereby repealed from and after July 1st, 1921. And the secretary of the treasury is authorized and directed to discontinue from and after such date or at such earlier date or dates as he may deem advisable. Such sub-treasuries and the exercise of all duties and functions by such assistant treasurer, treasurers or their offices, the office of each assistant treasurer specified above and the services of any off officers and employees assigned duty. Now, funny enough, guys, let's see. at Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then from what it looks like, these are all, if I'm not mistaken, locations of uh, 
the Federal Reserves. There's, it looks like there's 10 there. Uh, add in two more, and I think that's it. I'm not positive on that. I'll have to double check that, but that's what it appears to be. And over here, this is where it gets interesting. This office shall terminate upon discontinuance of functions that of that office by Secretary of Treasury. The Secretary of, Tre of the Treasury is hereby authorized in his discretion to transfer any or all of the duties and functions performed or authorized to be performed by the assistant treasurers above enumerated or their offices to the treasurer of the United States or the mints or assay offices of the United States under such rules and regulations as he may prescribe or to utilize any of the Federal Reserve Banks acting as depositories or fiscal agents of the United States for the purpose of performing any and all such duties. So, yeah. Um, I'm not going to read it all, but there you guys go. There's quite a bit there. Um, moving on. Oh, let me see here. Yeah, moving on. 1920. 1921. The Council on Foreign Relations was founded to direct the media. Paul Warburg was its first director. Warburg also drafted the Federal Reserve Act and became the Fed's first governor. Paul Warburg was an agent for the Rothschilds banking dynasty. 1925. So as you saw there, the Council on Foreign Relations. And we've already gone over the Federal Reserve Act right here. This is the Council on Foreign Relations here. Wikipedia, I know there's actually a better link on that one page, but this is, I was trying to find something, um, I was trying to find good information that was off of just their page. Um, I'm going to link their page uh, because they have a lot of really good information there. But I wanted to give you guys, um, you know, I, I like to get other sources besides just uh, sticking with one specific place. As it adds uh, way more um, credibility, you know, it, it, you get better uh, results. Uh not to be confused with the Committee on Foreign Relations or European Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, they're all tied together, though. Um, the Council of Foreign Relations, CFR, founded in 1921, is a United States nonprofit think tank specializing in foreign policy and internal, uh, international affairs. Um, actually, what it really does is it controls the media. Uh, it is headquartered in New York City. Funny how all of these are headquarters uh, have a headquarters in New York City, and I guarantee you even more funny is that all of those buildings are all right next to each other on the Federal Reserve, um, with an additional office in D.C. And its membership, which is 4,900, has included senior politicians, more than a dozen secretaries of state, CIA directors, bankers, lawyers, prof professors, and senior media figures. As I said, that's their main job is to spin the media. The CFR meetings convene government officials, global business leaders, and prominent members of the intelligence and foreign policy community to discuss international issues. The CFR publishes the bi-monthly journal Foreign Affairs and runs the David Rockefeller Studies Program, which influences foreign policy by making recommendations to the presidential administration and diplomatic community testifying before Congress, interacting with the media, and publishing on foreign policy issues. Um, this goes into a brief uh, uh, history, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You guys can take a look at this, um, but this is just to paint a picture for you guys. And actually, Paul Warburg wanted to go into him. Paul Morowitz Warburg, 1868 to 1932 was an American banker born in Germany. He was actually uh, Jewish uh, and an early advocate of the U.S. Federal Reserve System. He was more than an advocate. Advocate. This guy literally is the uh, asshole that pushed this into existence. 
Um, early life, Warburg was born in Hamburg, Germany, a uh, Jewish banking dynasty. His parents were Moritz and Esther. And I wouldn't even be surprised, I'm not positive on this, but uh, what was that other Jewish banking family there uh, in Italy? Um, man, they began with an M. I'm trying to think of them. But uh, Medici? Medici? I, I think maybe, they, I wouldn't be surprised if they're somehow uh, um, connected. Uh, after graduating from Real Gymnasium in Hamburg, 1886, he entered the employ of Simon Hauer, a Hamburg importer and exporter, uh, Samuel Montague and Company. Let's see. Founder of New York investment firm Con Loeb and Co. The Warburgs. And now, where is it? Where he goes into the? He actually signed uh, the Federal Reserve Act. I know that he became its first governor. Um, he also. Let's see. Here we go. This is what I was trying to get into. Uh, Warburg became known as a persuasive advocate of central banking in America. Um, he was basically uh, very involved with the Morgans, the Rothschilds, all those assholes. Um, who served variously as the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, the head on the Council of Foreign Relations. Just so happens that, and when you look back on the history of um, anybody to do with the Federal Reserve or you know any of those elite families, they're all they all got their hands in all of these pots. They're in the Council of Foreign Relations and uh, somewhere on the board for the Federal Reserve or uh, they're in, you know, members of the Bilderberg. You, you just, you, you name it and, and they are. Um, let's see. Credited Warburg with doing Yale man's service and preaching in the doctrines and practices of modern Central European banking. While all the other friends of sound money were so occupied with battling against the free silver movement that they gave scant thought to the need for currency reform. Um, so this is pretty much one of the individuals that uh, pushed for our, the silver and gold to be stolen from us. Okay, He's a real douchebag. Chief credit for putting, uh, putting over the Federal Reserve System. And then, let's see here. So basically what we had was we had a bunch of these foreign assholes, okay? that they came over and immigrated and, and we see this very often um, even today where we get these foreign um, you know assholes that, that come over and then they want to change everything about our country uh, to the way that they want it and uh, this particular guy um, you know being a dirty son of a gun um, was able to make that happen um, and he did it in some pretty uh, shitty ways from what I've gathered. So, let's see. Shortly thereafter, the New York Times published Warburg's uh, defects and needs of her banking system concerning the financial system. Um, just so you guys know, basically that was propaganda. Uh, he argued the United States is, in fact, at about the same point that had been reached in Europe at the time of the Medici's. Uh, Oh, I guess I was kind of right. He, uh, there must be some kind of tie there. Um, in all likelihood, at the time of the Hammurabi, the chief reason for this lagging state of development was the lack of a central institution. It's always just so happens that uh, we're having a problem that uh, 
lines right up with the agenda that they're pushing, isn't it? That's because they create the problem so that they can get their agenda pushed. Um, that could uh, re-discount bank promissory notes to facilitate the exchange of promises of future for uh, payment for cash. A central bank constructed along the lines of the Reich Bank could fulfill this role. Um, and Reich, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that was the Rothschilds before they changed the name. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that from what I've read that the Reich uh, were the Rothschilds' original name, and then they changed it to the Rothschilds so they wouldn't sound so German um, because of the, uh, you know, the Nazi Germany uh, issues there. Uh, according to Warburg, and thus make it easier for the excess reserve, rever, uh, reserves of one bank to be used to bolster the insufficient reserves of another. Um, Warburg's ideas gained a wider hearing after the Panic of 1907. Like I said, just so happens that whenever there's an agenda that they that somebody comes and wants, um, that has enough power and enough money, we somehow have some kind of a crisis or uh, a disaster or a dilemma that just so happens to, to um, go along with that agenda being the solution. Uh, that's why they say order out of chaos, uh, problem, reaction, solution. Anyway, you can keep going on. Uh, the National Monetary Commission, Bank of Manhattan uh, Company. He founded and became the first chairman of accept, uh, American Acceptance Council. He organized and became the first chairman of International Acceptance Bank of New York. International Acceptance was acquired by the Bank of Manhattan Company in 1929 with Warburg becoming the chairman of the combined organization. Became the director on uh, CFR at its founding in 1921. Uh, member of the Advi Advisory Council of Federal Reserve Board, serving as president um, of the Advisory Council. He was a trustee of the Institute of Economics. On March 8, 1929, Warburg warned of the disaster threatened by the wild stock speculation, uh, foreshadowing, oh, just so happens he had, he knew that in advance, just like he knew there was problems up here uh, with uh, the, the lack of a central bank. He comes along, he says, then the problem starts, and boom, then it's implemented. So, yeah, this douchebag also was one of the main key players in uh, causing for uh, the gold and silver to be taken. Um, and a lot of the disaster and, and uh, suffering that individuals had across the nation during the time of his life, pretty much. So... Funny enough, political science in Berlin, um, yeah... Anyway, and then there's more on, on this uh, this guy here. Warburg's crusade to establish central bank in the United States. And was chosen by Woodrow Wilson to serve as one of the first members of the Federal Reserve Board. Um, so there's a lot here. You guys can take a look. As I said, I don't want to make this video like super, super filled with uh, like too much um, reading here. Uh, that is for you guys to be able to do to follow up and do your due diligence to understand everything. Here's more of Paul uh, War on America. When I first started uh, writing articles in 2005, I probably uh, promulgated many popular theories about World War II because of my ignorance. I cringe when I read some of my early efforts. I could cleanse my own archives, but it would be like trying to capture feathers in a whirlwind because my articles are on other websites. Blah, 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 blah. Uh... 
People perpetuate false flag information often unknowingly because he, she is quoting or relying on other people's information. Each of us needs to engage in independent objective research. Definitely. I agree there wholeheartedly. Uh, on February, oh no, this is a different Paul Warburg. This must have been the sun. February 17th, 1950, James Paul Warburg uh, confidently declared to the United States Senate, we shall have world government whether we like it or not. And, and it's funny how a lot of these, um, a lot of these individuals uh, will actually, you know, their, their families stay uh, keeping the parents' work alive. You know, they're basically <coughs> with the elites instead of, you know, how you or I, um, would tell our children that they, we want them to be their own, uh, have their own individuality, uh, you know, become what it is that they want to believe. Well, no, they're brought up from the time that they're very young, uh, that they have a specific, 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 um, job, and that is, uh, to complete the work of thy father. Um, so let's see. It's all about world government. New World Order. Uh, the only question is whether world government will be achieved by conquest or consent. So that was all part of his, uh, his quote there. By conquest or consent, James Paul Warburg was the son of Paul Morowitz War Warburg, that's the, uh, the original, um, and nephew of both Felix Warburg and Jacob Schiff, both associated with Khan Loeb and Company, which uh, financed the Russian Revolution through James brother uh, Max Baker to the government of Germany. So yeah, take, take a look at this. This stuff's uh, really, unfortunately in the United States, the establishment's goal of a one world order is reaching fruition through uh, complacent consent and subversive uh, conquest. America, a constitutional republic is plunging into the satanical one world order facilitated by um, The calculated placement and unscrupulous individuals deeply dedicated to the goals. It's these shadow assholes. And uh, it goes back to the, um, you know, the Federal Reserve. Uh, it goes back to the um, uh, Bank of International Settlements. And people, I got people asking, well, how could the Bank of International Settlements be above the Federal Reserve when it wasn't even, uh, you know, founded in the, until 1930? Well... Let me tell you something funny. Just the fact that it was founded in 1930 is very interesting because a lot of things happened um, on or around that that year. And uh, it was already um, in action. If you actually look into the, uh, the history on it, it was, in, it was already in action and it was already in existence uh, long before that. It, it precedes the Federal Reserve. Uh, it's just that it wasn't um, public knowledge or openly uh, discussed. So, and to the trolls that, that all of a sudden pop up on this video and want to put a bunch of nonsense on there, trying to, like, you know, discredit or create negativity, if you just created your account, you got you don't have a single liked video, you don't have a single subscriber, you don't have anybody subscribed to you, um, you don't have a picture, and, uh, yeah, you basically got nothing, I'm just going to block your ass because I'm seeing more and more of that. I'm seeing them in trolls coming out now. And you can tell, it's just like a brand new account. Um, oh, I'm going to get to that. All right, we're going back to the video. So. Hi. The United States Corporation Company was charged in perpetuity in Florida by its fiscal agent. Source document, Articles of Incorporation, United States Corporation Company. This company was created without the approval of Congress, nor the knowledge and authority of the American people. Note, in 1925, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York had offices on Cedar Street and on Broadway, both cited in the Articles of Incorporation. Source document, Articles of Incorporation, United States Corporation Company. The United States Corporation Company created a maximum of 100 shares of stock. Source document, Articles of Incorporation, United States Corporation Company. 
The Articles of Incorporation revealed the names of three individuals who held only five shares. The other shareholders were not identified. Now, why is that? 1920s. The U.S. Treasury was raided by the private federal... Alright. So... Now, they were just talking about the United States uh, Corporation Company, and that, this happens to be that document, the real one, okay? So, as we take a look here, Articles of Incorporation filed, uh, it's July 15th, 1925. Take a look. Certificate of Incorporation of the United States Corporation Company, okay? So, it's filed... In 1925, just so happens that their main offices are <laughs> just so happen to be where? Right by the Federal Reserve in New York. You're going to get to that. So, as you can see here, Certificate of Incorporation, United States Corporation Company. Uh, the nature of the business, and it just, you know, it goes on just like any document would. Okay. Um, let's see. We move down. And right here. Where is it? I had it uh, set up here earlier. I'm trying to find it. goes into quite a bit. Business of the corporation is from time to time uh, to do any one or more of the acts and things uh, there herein set forth. They may conduct business in the state of Florida, other states, District of Columbia, the territories and colonies of the United States, and in foreign countries have one or more offices of the state of Florida, carry, purchase, mortgage, and convey real and personal property uh, within or without the state of Florida. The maximum number of shares for this corporation is authorized to have an out, outstanding at any one time is 100. Okay, Each of the shares shall give shall have a per value of $100. And you got to think back when this was. Um, the amount of capital with which the corporation will begin business is $500, and again, that's uh, what they're starting it with, and that's uh, in the back on in the time, it's you know, substantially more than we think of today. Okay, we're talking about when you could buy, uh, you know, a gallon of gas for like I think it was like a penny or a couple cents. Um, so yeah. Oh, whoops. So here we go, and this goes into the, the corporation is to have perpetual existence. The principal office of the corporation shall be located in the Centennial Building, Tallahassee, uh, but its main offices are actually in New York City, as they referenced above. Um, the number of directors shall be three. The name of the directors who shall hold office for the first year of the corporation's existence or until their successors are elected and have uh, qualified in their post office addresses are as follows. So, yep, as you can see, New York. They're all in New York because that's where they were. the main office was. Um, this was a lot of uh, bait and switch and shell game, you know what I mean? Um, so let's go to the shares, the names and post office addresses of the subscribers of the certificates and the number of shares of stocks each will agree to take are as follows. So Lewis got two, lucky him. Samuel got two. Arthur got one. So where's the other 95 shares? Hmm. I guess the person, person or people with those 95 shares really did not want their names to be known, huh? And if you know anything about it, I mean, whoever's got the majority of shares, those are the individuals that truly control the uh, the corporation, uh, the stockholders with the most. 
Um, the directors and stockholders shall have, have power to hold their meetings and have one or more offices uh, and keep the books of the corporation except original or duplicate stock ledger outside of the state of Florida at any such place or places as from time to time may be designated by, by the bylaws or by the resolution of the board. Now, um, notice how they specifically state that it'll be, it can be outside of the state of Florida because this was done as in, if it was in the state of Florida, um, this was all done as a big distraction. It was to hide the truth behind what this really was. And, um, yeah, uh, that's because business was being done in uh, New York mainly. And as I said, those that hold the most stock hold the most power and decisions. And I'll guarantee you somebody had at least 50 shares. And I think we know who those, are, those people are. Um, I'll tell you, my main guess, the person be, name, be, last name begins with R and ends with D. Could be even worse than that, though. Who knows? Oh, you know what? I think it tells us something really big right here. See this guy's last name? They don't do that in coincidence. It, everything has a purpose. And this just so happens to be made sure that it's on its own separate line uh, in capital letters, which as we know is because it's corporate fiction, these names. But yeah, there's no there, there's a reason why this was done like that. So moving on, let's see. This is more on that. United States Corporation Company Certificate of Incorporation. Connecting the Department of Transportation to the legislatively. There appears to be evidence sufficient to show that the 1787 Constitution of the United States was never submitted to the people who are enfranchised to vote for its ratification. It is therefore incumbent upon the people um, to ratify the 1787 Constitution of, for the United States of America and begin anew with the nullification of Amendments 11 through 27. So, anyway, this is just another uh, page where you can get that document. And then this is the United States Corporation Company, uh, U.S. Department of Transportation, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, Licensing and Insurance Public Process Agents. So, this is to give you guys a little idea. As you can see... There is one in just about every state. So, and again, all these documents will be in the description box. And then, let's see. This is the United States Corporation uh, Company. The United States Corporation Company is filed as a domestic business uh, corporation in the state of New York on Thursday, October 2nd, 1902, and is approximately 115 old, years old, according to public records. Uh, now, that document that we saw... Um, was filed in 1925, so I assume that there was, uh, there, there must be more documents besides that. And then you can take a look here. This is the network visualizer here. Uh, 
it'll show other corporations and whatnot that's connected to it, um, individuals, etc. You see, can I save this image? Let's see. All that's downloading. Key people. I think all these key people here are probably just uh, uh, fall guys or puppets. See, this is file 1925. Uh, there seems to be a lot of uh, secrecy and, um, you know. Yeah, see, there's one in all the different states. As I was saying, there's at different state levels, there's different filings. That was in 1955. This was in 1923 in California. Lawyers Incorporating Service, uh, Nevada, 1925, New York, 1902, so this was the original filing. Name, history, actual, uh, articles of incorporation, 1925, registered agent change, 1971, same, 1977, same, 1977, 1978, 1982, 1984, 1987, uh, and then an amendment in 1987, and then annual lists. Let's see if I can look at that picture now and blow it up. Uh oh, it didn't give me what I wanted. Okay. So. Let's take a look. Number of shares zero, cattle stock, 
value per share 50,000 none available Huh. So you can see a fictitious name must be used when an actual name of a foreign entity is unavailable for its use in New York State. So that's the capital fictitious, as we've been talking to you guys about. I'll have to go into that another time and um, see if I can download that. I can buy it and then blow it up. Uh, you know, blow up the picture so we can see it better. Let's see. The Act of 1871, the United States is a corporation. There are two constitutions. So this goes even before all of this. Um, the Act of 1871, this is what I was talking to you guys about with the dual constitutions. Um, I know most of you have heard me talking about that already. Uh, for those of you new, uh, there is actually two constitutions. The real constitution has not been in use. Um, they drafted a fictitious constitution, which was for the District of Columbia or the Corporation um, of the United States. Um, and that has actually... Um, pretty much permanently disabled the real Constitution uh, and all of our liberties with it. Since the Act of 1871, which established the District of Columbia, we have been living under the United States Corporation, which is owned by certain international bankers and aristocracy, aristocracy sorry, of Europe <coughs> and Britain. In 1871, the Congress changed the name of the original Constitution by changing one word, and that was a very significant. That was as was very significant as you will read. Some people do not understand that one word or two words difference in any legal document do make a critical difference. But Congress has known and does know this. In 1871, February 21st, Congress passes an act to provide a government for the District of Columbia, also known as the Act of 1871. With no constitutional authority to do so, Congress creates a separate form of government for the District of Columbia, a 10-mile square parcel of land. Um, see Acts of the 41st Congress, Section 304, or 34, Session 3, Chapter 61 and 62. Um, 